So naturally, the Biden administration is calling for gun control. Understand, this is all part of their broader pitch, which is that Joe Biden needs to rule the world. This, this, this man who is falling apart, this administration that has 50 plus Kamala Harris in the Senate, is going to try to ram everything they possibly can through. Axios is reporting that now Joe Biden, you know, Captain Propriety, you know, the, the lion of the Senate, this longtime institutionalist, he's now looking at nuking the filibuster. According to Axios, President Biden recently held an undisclosed East Room session with historians that included discussion of how big is too big, how fast is too fast to jam through once in a lifetime historic changes to America. Four things are pushing Biden to jam through what could amount to a $5 trillion plus overhaul of America and vast changes to voting, immigration, and inequality. One, he has full party control of Congress. Two, he has party activists egging him on. Three, he has strong gathering economic wins at his back. And four, he is popular in the polls. Naturally, presidential historian Michael Beschloss, who's a big government hack, told Axios that FDR and LBJ may be the closest analogs to Joe Biden. People close to Biden say he is feeling bullish on what he can accomplish. He is fully prepared to support dashing the Senate filibuster rule to allow Democrats to pass voting rights and other trophy legislation for his party. One, because he loves the narrative that he is bigger and bolder than Obama. It's making him happy. The Obama administration is ticked about this, by the way. Obama is unhappy at this because he wants to be Captain Transformation, but it turns out that it is Biden, the old man, who is coming in and just showing him up. Mitch McConnell says this will create such a fissure between the parties that it will be nuclear winter. But that's that's basically right. By the way, that is really not the risk. The risk is not that nothing gets done in the Senate. The risk is that a bunch of stuff gets done in the Senate and that state governors just say, we are not going to go along with any of this. You want to exacerbate the country's national divides? You want to make sure that red states just stop helping out the federal government? You want to make sure that the country starts to fracture at all of its seams? Do exactly what Joe Biden is doing right now. And by the way, do it on the issue of gun control. If Joe Biden tries to nuke the filibuster in order to cram down federal gun control, in complete contravention of the Constitution of the United States. Good luck. If you think that citizens of Texas or Alabama or Tennessee or Florida are going to sit still and let the federal government tell them what to do with their guns, the federal government's going to have another thing coming. You want to exacerbate conflict to the point of possible violence? That is the exact way to do it. See, here's the thing that the left needs to understand about gun ownership for people who are not of the far left in the United States. It is a fundamental right in the United States to be able to protect yourself, including with guns. The reason to own guns is to stop people from violating your fundamental rights. And the first sign that your fundamental rights are about to be violated is when someone comes to your door and demands your guns. Okay, so this is a completely self-defeating proposal. Nonetheless, this is exactly what Biden is apparently pushing forward. And now he's talking about nuking the filibuster in order to do all of this stuff. So Jen Psaki announced yesterday that Biden is considering executive action on guns. She apparently said, putting in place common sense gun safety measures has been a passion of the president since he was in the Senate. By the way, common sense gun safety measures, that is a euphemism for gun control measures that have no evidentiary backing, right? Like the 1994 assault weapons ban, which studies demonstrate did nothing to stop mass shootings or to decline the rate of homicide in the United States. Apparently, according to Jen Psaki, his his position on the filibuster has not changed as of yet, but we are considering a range of levers, including working through legislation, including executive action that has been under discussion, will continue to be under discussion. Joe Biden himself came out and called for gun control yesterday. Of course he did. I don't need to wait another minute, let alone an hour, to take common sense steps that will save the lives in the future and to urge my colleagues in the House and Senate to act. We can ban assault weapons and high-capacity magazines in this country once again. I got that done when I was a senator. It passed. It was law for the longest time. And it brought down these mass killings. We should do it again. No, it did not bring down the mass killings. The evidence on that is scanty to nil. Okay, And again, watching this incoherent president try to push forward a massive gun grab is pretty impressive stuff. Now, by the way, the first... The first notion that you should have that the government is about to invade your rights is when they tell you they're not about to invade your rights. When they assure you that they're not about to come for your wallet, they're coming for your wallet. And when they assure you that they are not coming for your gun, pretty good time to start buying rifles from Bravo Company Manufacturing (laughs) before the government tries to make it illegal to do so. So when Vice President Kamala Harris says, don't worry, you know, they keep saying we're coming for your guns. Yes, because you keep saying you're coming for our guns. That would be why. I remember when Hillary Clinton said this in 2016. In the 2016 campaign, she was like, they keep saying that I want to come for your guns. I don't want to come for your guns. I just want an Australian gun buyback program. Oh, you mean the mandatory gun buyback program in Australia where they came for the guns like that? Here's Kamala Harris saying, you don't need to feel threatened. 
All we're going to do is, you know, massive gun legislation. And I believe that it is possible, it has to be possible, that people agree that these slaughters have to stop. And this is, again, you reject the false choice and stop pushing it for sure. Stop pushing the false choice mm -hmm. that this means everybody's trying to come after your guns. That is not what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Then who's, and I love the, the reporter there. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but then whose guns are you coming after? Who's got, like whose? Whose guns? That should be the question. Not what kind of guns, whose guns? Because what I've noticed is that you are not targeting criminals. Right now, they want felons to vote, but they want you, the law-abiding citizen, not to be able to get a gun. This is the Democratic agenda at this point. Again, the evidence that the 1994 assault weapons ban did a damn thing is just not there. According to the Foundation for, according to the Foundation for Economic Education, these studies demonstrate that there is no evidence assault weapons ban reduced the homicide rate. Between 1994 and 2004, the federal government banned the manufacture, sale, or transfer of assault weapons in large capacity magazines. A DOJ study found no evidence the ban had any effect on gun violence and stated it should be renewed. The ban that should it be renewed, the ban's effects on gun violence are likely to be small at best and perhaps too small for reliable measurement. Because again, if you're going to look at the kinds of guns that are most frequently used in homicides, they are not long guns. They are not rifles. And they are certainly not rifles that are used in mass shootings. The number of mass shooting homicides involving assault weapons between 2007 and 2017, that's a 10-year period, was 253. The number of total homicides in the United States was 150,000. The number of gun homicides in that period was 104,000. 253 mass shooting homicides involving assault weapons happened during that period. So your notion is that you're going to take the 100 million, right? There are 100 million long guns in circulation in the United States, and that's what you're going to target? It doesn't even make any sense. Again, the, the, the notion that assault weapons bans somehow generated a, a, an impact on the frequency of mass shootings, it's just not there. The, the Prior to the ban, on average, five people were killed with assault weapons in the mass shootings per year. During the ban, the number went down to four. Post-ban, it rose to 22. But mass shootings with assault weapons didn't rise until 2012. That was eight years after the ban ended. In the seven years after the ban, there was an average of four people killed in mass shootings with assault weapons every year. So maybe it turns out it's not the kind of weapon that is the problem. Maybe it turns out that it is a bunch of different factors that are the problem. Okay, but they, they have to lie. Okay, they, they have to lie about how easy it is to get a gun. They have to lie about the threat of mass shootings in American society generally. They have to lie about the efficacy of gun control generally. Because again, if you actually told the truth about the efficacy of gun control, you know where you might be looking. Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York City, L.A., and it turns out gun control there has not been wildly successful. The only thing that has tamped down homicide is heavy policing. It is precisely the opposite of the policy proposals the left likes. Okay, so instead, they just have to maximize the, the way that they talk about the problem. So you'll have Chuck Schumer talking about the epidemic of gun violence. First of all, gun violence is not an epidemic. We actually have been through an epidemic in the last year. An epidemic is defined by the contagiousness and transmissibility of something. Gun violence is not transmissible. It is not an epidemic. It is acts of individual evil. Those can be tamped down by adding more police force to places that are high crime. But the, the, what Democrats are basically trying to say is that the gun infects you. The gun does not infect you. It is a piece of machinery. It is a tool. But here's Chuck Schumer saying we're going to address the quote unquote epidemic of gun violence. Republicans seem averse to even wanting to talk about the epidemic of gun violence. Like the start of the COVID epidemic, their strat strategy is to downplay and hope the problem goes away. This Democratic-led Senate will be different. The Senate is not going to hide. We're going to debate and address the epidemics of gun violence in this country. Okay, but here's the thing. If you look at the number of homicides in the United States over the past 30, 40 years, we've had an unprecedented drop in the murder rate. An unprecedented drop in the United States murder rate since basically 1994. And yet the idea is that we're now experiencing this mass epidemic of gun violence. The national murder rate in the United States, according to the Death Penalty Information Center, the national murder rate in the United States in 1992 was 9.3 per 100,000 population. Okay, it reached its highs in about that period. It was really high in the, in the late 70s and then kind of stabilized. And then its modern high was 1991, 9.8 murders per 100,000 residents. 
Currently, in about 2016, 2017, the lowest it hit was about 2014. 4.5 murder. It went in half. In half. Okay, but the idea is that now it's an epidemic. And again, it is not an epidemic. That's not how epidemics work. But it's all a power grab. And so they have to lie. So Senator Padilla, he says, in a majority of states, is it Alex Padilla, Democrat of California? He says, in a majority of states, it is easier to obtain a gun than to vote. This is just an overt lie. There's not a single state in the United States where it's easier to obtain a gun than to vote. I mean, do these people know a damn thing about how you obtain a gun? You actually have to go in to a federally licensed firearms dealer. And then you have to show ID. And then they have to run a federal background check on you. And if there's a backlog, you might have to wait a couple of days while they actually run the federal background check on you. That's at a minimum. Okay, when you go to register to vote, you show an ID and you're registered to vote. And that's the end of it. Here's Alex Padilla just overtly lying. There won't be a Media Matters fact check on this guy. In 25 states, voters must be registered and have specific forms of ID in order to cast a ballot. But those same states allow people to buy rifles without permits and require no background checks for some sales. Additionally, in a majority of states, new voters are able to obtain a rifle quicker than they're able to cast their first ballot. It seems to me that we have our priorities entirely backwards when it comes to this, when we make it easier to buy a gun. Than the, we these geniuses, let's put them in charge of whether you can defend yourself. Meanwhile, Dick Durbin, who once called American soldiers akin to Pol Pot, Dick Durbin said loopholes make it easier for felons and abusers to get weapons. Okay, again, the, the proof that these felons and abusers are getting weapons because of quote-unquote loopholes is extremely scanty. Very, very scanty. Doesn't matter. Don't need evidence. You just make assertions because assertions are all the left cares about. Here's Dick Durbin making the case. There are well-known gaps in the federal gun background check system, the gun show loophole, the internet loophole, and more. These gaps make it too easy for felons abusers and mentally unstable people to get their hands on guns and harm others. Okay, so first of all, there is no gun show loophole. If you go to a gun show, they have to be a federally licensed firearms dealer. They, what, what is the so-called gun show loophole is not gun shows. Okay, that's me conveying a gun to my son. In order for the government to prevent that, they would have to have full-fledged gun registries for every gun in the United States, which is something that no advocate of individual liberty should be in favor of. But let's be real about this. This is basically, in the end, just an emotional appeal. This is why you have victims of mass shootings going on TV and saying that the NRA is a terror organization and that every member of the NRA is apparently a terrorist. Here's Fred Gutenberg, who's an anti-gun activist. Uh, he's a Parkland dad, saying this on MSNBC. They are a terror organization that is making us less safe. You can't make up these things. I mean, literally six days ago, the NRA achieved its goal, and they called it victory for Colorado. That's what they called it. And here we are, 10 people dead, including a police officer, because of what they believe was victory for Colorado. Okay, except that Colorado already, oh, stop it. Colorado already has universal background checks, red flag laws. The city of Boulder, for two years, and only expired six days ago, which is what the NRA was talking about. They had an assault weapons ban. They had all of those things in place. Again, the evidence doesn't matter. It's the emotional appeal. And why don't we just wreck the, we'll wreck the filibuster and we'll ram through gun control. That's what Julian Castro is now saying. He's saying filibuster reform to ram through gun control because the Democratic agenda is the only thing that matters. And if you don't have evidence to back it, you just say that people who, d who oppose you don't care enough and don't have sympathy for people who have died in mass shootings. I actually think this is going to be another indictment of the filibuster. Uh, how do you not call something strongly bipartisan in this country when almost 90 percent of Americans support it, and yet mainly one political party stands completely against it. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And this is one more example of why, in the least, we need significant filibuster reform that makes it possible for effective, meaningful legislation like this to, to actually get enacted. I mean, this is I'm sorry. These people are so. It's so ignorant. I mean, unbelievably ignorant. Alison Camerata just asked this morning on CNN, quote, how onerous would it be to have a gun shop owner just say, by the way, are you hearing voices? Do you think people are chasing you? Do you think everybody is watching you? It would have weeded out possibly this guy. Yes, I'm sure that if you want to weed out criminals, all you have to do is ask them whether they're mentally ill. That would totally do it. By the way, 
You know what gun shops have to do? I know because I just purchased a gun the other day. You know what gun shops have to do? They ask you about your recent mental illness history. It's a thing they ask you on the forms. Again, evidence is unnecessary here. All that matters is that they are morally right and very emotional about it. And therefore, you are bad if you oppose their evidence-free agenda, which suggests that all the problems in America are based on individual rights and apparently on white supremacy or whiteness or something. Facts don't care about your feelings. And it's a fact that The Ben Shapiro Show is the largest conservative podcast in the nation. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all of our content.